Good morning, everyone. Good morning, everyone. It's like my students almost. <laughs> I'm Marnie Campbell, and I am an associate professor in the Department of African American Studies. I'm also the faculty senate president. Thank you. <laughs> Provost Thomas Spoon earned his BS from Fairfield University and his PhD from UCLA, both in chemistry. He began his teaching career as a Camille and Henry Dreyfus postdoctoral fellow at Colby College in Waterville, Maine. His first tenure track position was at Randolph Macon College in Ashland, Virginia, where he won the Thomas Branch Award for Excellence in Teaching. In 2000, he returned to Southern California as an assistant professor of chemistry at the Claremont Colleges, eventually earning tenure at three of the colleges in the consortium, Pitzer, Scripps, and Claremont McKenna. He served in various administration roles at, administrative roles at Pitzer College for eight years, including senior associate dean of faculty, accreditation liaison officer, and interim president. In 2017, he became executive vice president and provost here at LMU, and he says that he's been pinching himself ever since. <laughs> he has primarily taught courses in organic chemistry, instrumental methods, and first year seminar. Where's the core director? His scholarship and publications have been in the areas of DNA repair, photochemistry, natural products, isolation, chemical synthesis, and novel ways to manipulate a nasty form of oxygen called singlet oxygen. In all, these publications have included a total of 36 undergraduate student um, co-authors. He's also published extensively on chemical pedagogy, including new laboratory practices, hybrid teaching methods, and new techniques for teaching organic chemistry to the visually impaired. He is a co-author on two textbooks, and his introductory organic chemistry text is now in its sixth edition. He has recently begun publishing on equity and access in STEM higher education, including a book chapter in the Stylus Press edited volume titled, Difficult Subjects, Insights and Strategies for Teaching About Race, Sexuality, and Gender, and a chapter in the forthcoming Emerald Press edited volume titled, Culturally Responsive Strategies for Reforming STEM Higher Education, Turning the Tides on, in on Inequity. Here are a few fun facts about Provost Poon. <laughs> Nothing too, you know, um, <laughs> useful <laughs> for later on. He's a proud first generation student, a proud immigrant. He plays guitar, but his favorite instrument is unquestionably the ukulele, and he tells us we're all pronouncing it wrong. He's run four marathons, including Los Angeles, Las Vegas, New York, and Boston, and competed in three different distances of triathlon. He's volunteered at two organizations that support the needs of the underrepresented and under-resourced, Learning Ally, where he created audio translations of textbooks for the visually impaired, and Bright Prospect, a community-based organization that empowers high-potential, low-income students to gain admission, succeed, and graduate from four-year colleges and university, where he serves on the Business Advisory Council. He is currently serving as a commissioner on the American Council of, on Education Commission on Internationalization and Global Engagement, and he's married to an English professor at another institution and has a 10-year-old daughter. There's no pressure on her at all in life. <laughs> Provost Thomas Poon. Thank you, Marnie. Thanks for that introduction, uh, and especially for your partnership as, as faculty senate president. Folks, before I uh, begin, um, I'd like to address the incident Friday night that shook our LMU community. Uh, in response to a false threat on campus, the university's protocols, uh, they failed. And we fell short in our obligation to inform you promptly. 
the response was unacceptable, and uh, we are committed to ensuring that this never happens again. Uh, to that end, LMU is retaining an external firm to investigate our protocols and procedures and to recommend ways that we can better communicate with you in an emergency. We intend to be transparent about the findings uh, of that investigation and share an action plan with the community in the near future. Your physical and emotional well-being are our top priorities and uh, we will do better. President Snyder will be hosting a town hall this week and details will be forthcoming about the town hall. In the past few days, we've all witnessed the devastation of the fires burning to our north and we continue to pray for those who have been impacted. I also wanna thank uh, the Faculty Senate Executive Committee, who works, of course, very closely with Marnie, and who has, who, who along with Marnie, have really developed a partnership with me this year, and I'm, I'm really uh, grateful for that. I want to thank all of you for attending, uh, taking time out of your busy days. Um, I want to thank President Snyder for giving me a job, <laughs> and for the autonomy really to make mistakes and figure things out on my own and also for your mentorship. Thank you, Tim. I also want to thank my cabinet colleagues for your collaborative spirit. Uh, it's really been a joy working with you and on projects and initiatives and uh, on problem solving. So today is when the US uh, officially celebrates uh, Veterans Day and so uh, I want to offer a word of thanks to our veterans. Many of you may know that we have an Air Force ROTC here at LMU, and it was established 70 years ago. Uh, it's commanded by Lieutenant Colonel William Ash Holland. Uh, LMU embraces our military personnel and um, our students from the military. We've awarded approximately $500,000 in Yellow Ribbon Institutional Matching Funds to over 50 veterans and their dependents. We've uh, processed over 2.6 million in educational benefit payments uh, from Veteran Affairs. LMU is proud to participate in the VA's Principles of Excellence program. Uh, right now we have approximately 100 students enrolled and supported through the GI Bill. And um, today, we have a Veterans Day celebration and reception uh, at the Hannon, William H. Hannon Library. Um, that's in the Von Der Ah family suite on the third floor um, from 4.30 to 6.30, and I hope that uh, many of you can attend that. How about a round of applause for our, our veterans here at LNU? So uh, what I want to do today is to update the LMU community on you know, various developments and opportunities and initiatives that we have here. I also want to express gratitude for your outstanding contributions to this university. And um, here's how I think we'll be going. So uh, there will be thanks uh, throughout the convocation address. Um, I wanna do some introductions as well, and there are some farewells that I need to do uh, from my staff as well. I wanna talk a bit about the strategic plan. Uh, there have been a lot of discussions swirling around that, and I think uh, this is an appropriate venue to, to update everyone on the strategic plan. I wanna talk and continue to talk about interdisciplinarity, continuing from where we left off last year, and I want to uh, highlight some new developments and opportunities, especially for students. I know there aren't that many students in the audience, but students, if you're watching online, that part will be especially for you. Okay, so introductions. I begin by introducing my team, right? my team of direct reports and also uh, those on my management team. Uh, they're of course listed in 
order of preference. I'm, I'm winking at you, Bryant. <laughs> no, you can tell it's alphabetical, right? Um, that's the only safe way to go. <laughs> now, more than half of these folks are new to their positions, right? So here they are, the, the folks that are new to some aspect of their position or their position entirely. And um, we have half of those are actually new to LMU. And two of those are deans, right? And they join indisputably the most talented uh, collection and team of deans in higher ed um, without a doubt. And I wanna thank them for their work, their advocacy for their colleges and schools, their faculty, students, but also for their amazing contributions to uh, LMU. How about a round of applause for our deans? All right, so let's get to it. I wanna talk about strategic planning. Now, uh, I did a lot of research about strategic planning at LMU, and based on how hard it was to get information, <laughs> I guarantee you you're gonna learn something about strategic planning at LMU. So, but before I begin, we currently have a strategic plan, right? And um, I, I, I would like, it, it, it's called the um, Forming Leaders Who Transform the World, and it's Loyola Marymount strategic plan from 2012 to 2020, right? And I know many of you were, were here when that plan was formulated and, and created. So one thing I wanna do, if you have your cell phones with you, right, is to get a sense of your understanding of that or this particular strategic plan, okay? So uh, if you take out your phone and go to uh, slide.do, right, or slido.com, whichever you prefer. If you go to that website and enter 1911, all right, the founding of LMU, into the field there, it'll take you to the poll that I wanna do. We're gonna have a, a few poll questions during this, uh, this convocation address. So the first poll question is coming right up. Let's see. There it is. Whoops. What's going on? Okay. Oh. It's not staying on the screen. Let's try this. It's interesting, no matter how you test something. Huh? All right, here we go. Oh, I guess it can't be plugged in. So, how long do you think it took the LMU community to develop our strategic plan? Was it under a year? A year, 1.5 years, two years, or if you weren't here then, uh, please select that option, okay? So um, I can have it update in real time, but I'm gonna wait and, uh, and have it update once everyone's had a chance to input their answer, okay? So if you're able to participate because you have your phone with you, uh, please do, it, it, it should be fun. So I'll give you about 30 seconds. Wow, 213 of you have already answered. Uh, 216, okay, I think um, I'll show some of the results now. <laughs> All right, so you're none the wiser, <laughs> half of you. <laughs> All right, so most of you say two years, right? That's what I had heard too, okay? That seems to be the, the, uh, the narrative that the last strategic plan, it was very collaborative, I have no doubt, and it took two years, okay? So we'll see about that. Uh, <laughs> all right, I'm gonna end this. Thank you for participating in that. Okay, so 
I learned that there were more strategic plans beyond this past one, right? So the, the, the oldest strategic plan I could find was uh, back over here in 1989. Uh, the, there used to be a university planning council. Uh, some of you may know that I changed the name of the uh, Provost Planning Council to University Planning Council, right? So this was really helpful to me because I didn't do anything, right? That was uh, untoward. Uh, so there was a University Planning Council, and it was charged with coming up with a strategic plan to take LMU into the, uh, the uh, 21st century, right? So the year 2000 and beyond. So if you look at that date, that's a 10-year strategic plan, right? And so the trustees... They actually didn't approve that strategic plan, but they approved parts of it. And I have uh, uh, Dean Brancolini to thank for finding this in the, the library archives. This is the document that they produced. Right? Some of you are saying, yeah, I remember that. <laughs> uh, so that's the document, and it took some of the, it, it, it created the mission that as we currently have it, it set out goals and objectives, just like a strategic plan would. It's a kind of a pamphlet. And, um, and here were the goals, academic excellence, fidelity to uh, the Catholic faith, liberal education, student-centeredness, personal care, right? formation of the whole person. You're hearing some of our mission statement in these uh, goals. Uh, the building of a campus community and participation and service uh, to the larger community. So, that was uh, not a strategic plan, but it was a strategic document. Uh, then in the year, so then 2000 comes along, right? And um, the then academic vice president and again, the University Planning Council, they conduct a year long strategic planning process, okay? Then the LMU trustees approved that process in 2001. So in both cases, strategic planning took about a year, right? We're not up to our current plan yet, but that's, that's, uh, that's the time frame, at least, back then. And that plan came up with some strategic initiatives, right? Promoting excellence in teaching and scholarship and creativity, providing an appropriate environment uh, for the development of a culture of excellence, so rigor, uh, reinforcing our Catholic identity, uh, building upon the Jesuit and our Jesuit and Marymount heritage, uh, enhancing the student intellectual experience, and developing and strengthening programs unique to LMU with regard to Southern California. So then in 2006, we actually had a strategic plan refresh. So last year's process wasn't new to LMU. We've refreshed our strategic plans before, okay? And the interesting thing about that refresh is if you'll look at the initiatives that came out of that, now this is a five-year plan, right? But if you look at the initiatives, they're fairly similar, right? So the lesson here, I think, is if, if your strategic plan is done right, your refresh doesn't have to do too much, okay? Um, it shortened a lot of it, it made it more concise, but as I'm sure you'll, you'll agree with me that the initiatives were pretty much uh, the same and definitely the same spirit, okay? So that, in, that refresh took us five years beyond. Oh, and here's an interesting thing I found in that refresh document. Um, it says that challenges remain, however, uh, and including moving, moving beyond the legacy of uh, perspective, the, the legacy perspective of the university being a secret jewel on the bluff, okay? So even back then, we had ambitions to, uh, to, to make what we do well known to the world, okay? All right, so then uh, a new strategic planning committee is constituted, and that was in 2011. So this is leading up to our strategic plan, right? So the answer to the poll question is that the strategic planning process 
for, to develop this document actually only took one year, right? Now, I know why you all think it took two years. Because after this strategic plan was approved by the trustees, then each individual unit, oh, and, and uh, here, are, here are those strategic themes, right? So um, you'll notice that, and if you go back and review this online uh, later on when the video is available, you'll notice that these themes are very similar, okay? Little refinements. Um, and again, in this strategic plan, we wanted to have a greater public awareness of LMU's successes. So again, the concept of getting off the bluff, all right? Okay, so here's why everyone thinks it was a two-year process. Because after the strategic plan was approved, then every, every unit, every school, college, and division was tasked with coming up with unit-level plans. Okay. And the provost then approved those plans um, uh, in 2013, in June of 2013. So that's the entire two-year process, right? And it sounds tiring, and from everything I've heard, it really was. <laughs> so, um, so that's one reason we didn't go into a full-on planning process when we decided to do a refresh of that strategic plan last fall, right? There's another good reason why we didn't go full-on strategic planning mode or even full-on refresh planning mode, and that's because if you think about it, we did some process where units and schools and colleges were engaged. They were asked to talk about, you know, what, what, what themes in the current strategic plan do we need to get, get moving on even more, right, and to shore up? And so these are the three themes that came to the fore. Uh, leadership and graduate education, our commitment to local and global citizenship, so internationalization, and promoting the teacher-scholar model, so themes two, four, and three. Now, what we could have done was we could have then took those themes and done something similar to the past, which was get everyone together, engage, talk about how we are going to uh, refresh this plan. But if you think about the timing, right, that was in December. So if we did that timing in the spring and it continued on into the fall, right, we'd only be about one and a half years out from the expiration of the plan, right? So I think, and, and in discussions with others, we decided it would be better if we didn't fatigue everyone, because if indeed we are going to do another strategic plan uh, in and around 2020, we want to be fresh, right? We want to be energized over this. And so I think we can be, and I'm going to talk about next, uh, these, the three themes that came up as, okay, we need, to, we need to really tackle these themes now uh, uh, before the plan expires. I'm gonna talk about some of those themes and, and to show you we're, in, we're making good progress and we will be ready for that next strategic plan um, come 2020. Okay, so, and I'm gonna, uh, although the graduate theme came up first and it had the most uh, the most votes, so to speak, from the different units, I'm gonna talk about uh, our local and global citizenship first, okay? So this is from our strategic plan. It's to better prepare students to become engaged participants. You can read that, I don't have to read it for you. Um, and you may recall that last year at my, at my convocation address, I talked about uh, something that the, the American Council on Education has studied for many years now, which is what, what they call comprehensive internationalization. And it had uh, six different components to it that you can see there. And one thing I noted in my convocation was that, you know, we had uh, several levels of engagement with internationalization, right? We had our strategic plan, of course. We had a working group. 
we had a uh, vision statement, and then we had an inter internationalization summit last fall, which was very successful. And so at my convocation last year, I said, it seems like we've had a, a good amount of engagement, so let's get moving, right? Time to stop talking and time to start walking. And so uh, the first thing I did was I hired Dr. Roberta Espinoza, our Vice Provost for um, Global Local Initiatives. And so I want to update you on some of the successes that she's had already. I think it's only been like six months, OK? So uh, for one, um, our study abroad, our semester-long programs, has seen the highest enrollment uh, in the past five years, a 30% increase over last year. The number of students on exchanges um, uh, has increased, highest number in six years. And our summer study abroad enrollments have increased as well. So great, great gains in uh, sending students abroad. Um, our financial assistance to students studying abroad has increased 8% for the last two years in each year. We just hired a director for study abroad. Um, we can't announce it yet because we're still going through some um, background checking, but, um, but uh, knock on wood, I think everything is going to work out. And this is an opportunity to really thank someone that has um, been largely responsible for these successes, and that's uh, our interim director for study abroad, Kim Pita. Thank you, Kim. <laughs> I learned she actually started out working in the provost's office, right? And so uh, as a student, wow, that's incredible. Well, thank you for all that you've done. Um, we also have had the most ever number of Fulbright applicants at 37. The prior most was 35, right? So I'm very hopeful there, and we will find out next semester what happens to these 37 applicants. And so far in 2018 and 19, we've, or in this academic year, we've, our, our students have already won some pretty prestigious awards that you can see here. So uh, we're rocking and rolling in this department. We've also um, signed some MOUs. Roberta has a strategy to, or Vice Provost Espinoza, has a, a strategy to sign as many MOUs as we can because this will initiate uh, collaborations and exchanges between faculty and students and really bring uh, excellent minds together. Uh, so, so far, we've, we've uh, under Roberta's leadership, we've signed uh, an MOU with Ibo Americana in Puebla, Mexico. And in Asia, just today, we've signed an MOU with Fuyen Catholic University. Um, there's Fuyen Catholic University and uh, Vice President of International Affairs, Michael Lee, is actually here in the audience with his colleagues. <laughs> I thank uh, Dale Smith for actually initiating this MOU and this uh, collaboration. It, it, it looks to be very fruitful uh, in the future. We've also uh, increased our local engagement as well. So President Snyder, uh, Vice Provost Espinoza, and I met with the Mexican Council General uh, over the summer. And Roberta took it from there, and now she's um, uh, created a binational interdisciplinary lecture series that is going to be on immigration, education, and or gender. And she's established an internship program for LMU students at the consulate. And that's going to be uh, facilitated by our career and professional development uh, uh, office. So um, we're really looking forward to more of these local uh, partnerships as well. Thanks to Roberta, she, we've also applied to the United Nations, the Framework Convention on Climate Change, to, be a, uh, to have observer status, which will allow us to send students and faculty and staff delegates to these United Nations uh, meetings. Um, so Roberta wrote that up and submitted that, and uh, 
Apparently, we won't find out till 29, spring of 2020, right? Uh, I don't know what takes them so long, but, um, <laughs> but we got it in, and, and uh, I'm very hopeful. Last year, I talked about uh, establishing a database, right, so that if, for example, someone wanted to do a Fulbright, and this is one reason why Roberta is trying to establish these MOUs, because one of the hardest uh, or the most difficult things to do about a, to get a Fulbright is to establish that um, affiliation, right? We need an affiliation letter. We need commitments from another institution, usually a university. And by having these MOUs, we, we pre-establish relationships that will allow us to have affiliations uh, more easily and vice versa, because the Fulbright program, of course, works both ways. And so I'm happy to report that thanks to um, our department of ITS, uh, this data database is under development. Now, you may be saying, well, I wasn't consulted, and I do a lot of abroad stuff. Um, well, what we're trying to do first is port the data from our study abroad office first, right? We want to test it out, make sure it's good, before we ask folks to contribute to this database. But that is underway. And then one thing that uh, we're going to do is we're going to establish more center study abroad programs. We have a few right now, right? But um, based on my work with the, with the uh, Center for um, uh, International and Global Engagement at the ACE, uh, institutions, not just us, but institutions writ large, have to think more holistically when planning study abroad programs. So here's what Roberta and I have uh, been discussing. Right? So in order to have a distinguished uh, or a signature study abroad program, first of all, we need to consult. We need to consult with various constituencies. And at LMU, we need to consult with, of course, faculty. We need to consult with mission and ministry, student affairs, uh, of course, the deans and administrators in the colleges, of course, the study abroad office, and I think most importantly with the students, right? Because if the students don't want to go, what's the point, right? So we need to consult with these constituencies. We, of course, have to connect this study abroad experience with the local. And by local, I mean local communities. We are in one of the most international cities in the world, which uh, most likely has a community from whatever study abroad site we would be looking to establish. Uh, we, should, we should connect with student clubs and orgs. And of course, we should uh, consult with the consulate generals in Los Angeles or in California um, uh, to establish some local connections. Then one thing I think we need to do is we need to combine, uh, study abroad is what's known as a high impact practice, right? Uh, the definition of a high impact practice is something that increases retention and progress towards graduation, right? So in and of itself, it's a high impact practice. But there's no reason why we shouldn't combine high impact practices. So we need to combine study abroad and research experiences for our students, or study abroad and internship experiences, or study abroad and service learning type experiences. Those are all also high impact practices, and we should be combining them uh, to, to really be impactful for our students. Then we already have good pre-departure programming for students going abroad, right? We need, to, uh, we need to think more about returning programming for returning students, right? How to connect that experience abroad to the major or to uh, the career, career and professional development? Or um, you know, how do we reacclimate students? I, I, I can't tell you how many students I've heard from that have had a difficult time reacclimating to life in the States after studying abroad. And then we really need to connect them with the Office of National and International Fellowships because they are going to be uh, very well prepared for applying for some of these uh, fellowships after they come back from their experiences. And we really have to think about, right? Uh, this isn't coming top down. We're gonna have discussions about it. I know Jose, uh, uh, Associate Provost for Undergraduate Education, Jose Badenes, is working with the UCCC, 
all right, the university committee for the use, university core curriculum committee. Uh, they're working to assess the core right now, right? And hopefully from that assessment, we'll learn something about all of the core requirements and hopefully we'll be able to make some headway into what I'm hearing the most from students who study abroad, which is a lamentation that uh, they can't have some core requirements count uh, when they study abroad, right? And so um, hopefully we'll, we'll, we'll start thinking about those things. Okay, so there we, that's where we're going. That's some progress we've made in our global local uh, engagements and uh, uh, the theme of internationalization. So graduate education, we'll talk about that next. You can read this, this is from the strategic plan, right? And just like uh, I did before, I did some research on this. So here's the timeline for graduate education. Uh, back in 2008, we cons the, the, consulting f the Yardley consulting firm, we engaged with them and they issued a report. Now many things happened, a lot of leadership changes happened pretty much right after that report was submitted. Um, but that report had a few things that really caught my attention, right? That report said, uh, it's clear that LMU has issues with the infrastructure that supports graduate education, uh, that LA is a difficult city to navigate, and um, you know, the traffic, the transportation system makes it difficult for graduate education. And here's one that I will come back to, um, or ask you to come back to, and that is, in order to have successful and prominent graduate programs, it, it requires an alignment, right, and a consensus from various constituencies. You can see those constituencies here, right? Faculty, uh, chairs and directors of graduate programs, deans and administrators, okay? That is key. And I don't think we have that currently, at least, at least not from my listening tour. Okay, so then in, we had the strategic plan, of course, which highlighted this as a major theme, theme two. Uh, we then had a graduate education summit in May of 2013. In 2014, we had a graduate education task force that issued a report Okay, so we're doing a lot of engagement and discussion around graduate education. And probably because it's a hard thing to discuss. It's a hard thing to do well. Uh, then in 2017, um, we, did, we, we engaged with another firm, Hanover, to do an environmental scan of the region to, to let us know what types of opportunities there were in graduate education in the LA area. So that's where we are, and who am I to break with tradition, right? So uh, we are going to consult with yet another firm, okay? Um, and the reason I think this is necessary is because, and this firm is actually coming, where's David? Uh, this week, right? They're coming this week, right? Yeah. So this firm is known as the Art and Science Group out of um, Baltimore. Right. And, um, and they are, are well known for helping institutions think about graduate education, right? And to strategize around graduate education. The reason why I personally need this firm is because there isn't that synergy, there isn't that consensus between uh, graduate program directors and administration, and faculty, and deans. There just is not, okay? But what I have instructed this firm to do is to engage with the community, all stakeholders around graduate education. And I've told them the importance of culture, right? Um, Abby Robinson Armstrong had a speaker come uh, earlier this semester who talked about how very important it is to have, to, to remember that culture is the most important thing at any institution or organization. So when this firm comes, if you're one of those stakeholders and you're gonna meet with them, 
I've instructed them to let you speak your mind, and I hope you will. You really need to let the firm know what your desires are, what your greatest fears are around graduate education, what your hopes are, and the reasons behind them, right? It's not enough to say, oh, I don't want this, or we need this, right? But why? Why do we need this? Why do you think we need this? The firm will be programmed to capture these thoughts and to help me coalesce them. Um, I, I asked David uh, earlier, and that's because Vice Provost Sapp is really spearheading this. He has been doing this since last year, and um, without him, none of this would be possible. I wouldn't have even had the, the conceptual framework on how to pro approach this without his uh, advice and his hard work. And then in the meantime, uh, Vice Provost for Enrollment Management, Maureen Weatherwall, Weatherall has been serving as the Interim Vice Provost for Graduate Studies, and she's made uh, a lot of strides uh, in that area, uh, especially behind the scenes in the nuts and bolts of uh, graduate studies at LMU. So we have arranged for the consultants uh, this Wednesday and Thursday to meet with various stakeholders. Uh, but we also have some open meetings. We have three open meetings where you can come and really share your thoughts about graduate um, uh, education with the consulting group. So here they are, and um, you know, if you don't have time to write this down, you can always just uh, click on the video later and just fast forward to this point to get it. Okay, there's one other thing I wanna talk about with graduate education, and it's, it's kinda sad, but it's to announce that uh, Shake Kumijan has, has told me that she is going to be retiring at uh, the end of May. So Shake was a, appointed graduate director in 1997 and moved up in the ranks um, in her position. She served on key uh, search committees, such as the VP for Enrollment Management, uh, the Dean for, uh, the VP for Research and Dean of Graduate Studies, and the Dean for BCLA. Uh, she's had leadership on various task forces and committees. You can read them here, I don't have to read them for you. And uh, under her leadership, several new programs have developed here at LMU, several new graduate programs. And these are just a few of them, right? There was no room to list them all. But uh, some signature programs now, right? Yoga Studies, we have our EDD program in the School of Ed. Um, we have a new one, our Performance Pedagogy program in uh, Communication and Fine Arts. So uh, just amazing all the breadth of things that Shake has overseen. And then she hasn't only been adv uh, an advocate here at LMU, but externally uh, as well through her participation and memberships in these uh, organizations that are relevant to, to graduate studies. So is Shake here? Yeah, let's give her a, a, a great round of applause. Twenty-nine years, and of course there will be opportunities uh, in the spring semester to uh, celebrate and thank her uh, uh, personally as as the spring semester moves along. Okay, let's see where are we with time? Oh, I better rock and roll. Um, <laughs> I want to go to the teacher scholar model now. All right? You know we had some great validation, external validation of our teacher scholar model. Uh, this year when the Phi Beta Kappa Society uh, awarded us the sheltering of a chapter in our first attempt. And here is uh, Nick Rosenthal and um, uh, David Sapp. Oh, and, and this, I think this is uh, a little premature, although he's running on, on um, what's the word? Unopposed, unopposed right, unopposed. <laughs> so... <laughs> Unless he does something really bad, I think he's going to be the, the founding president of the chapter. Uh, but this is them at the Boston meeting working hard during the Q&A period uh, where they were really grilling us. Um, 
We also have uh, a wonderful honors program here led by uh, Professor Thadani uh, in psychology. And um, our own Kelly Younger wrote about our honors program. It's the jewel in the crown of academic programs here at LMU. And so to progress and move forward with this jewel, one thing that the Board of Trustees has approved is an honors house. So, um, and these folks were either uh, responsible, partly responsible for moving that, that proposal through or will be responsible for helping us to make this uh, a reality. But there's the house that's right next to campus. And here are the floor plans. We're going to have 10 honor students living in this house and an 11th student as a, a, I think a res, I don't know the correct term, resident advisor. All right, yeah. Um, so it's gonna have meeting spaces, outdoor, indoor, uh, classrooms, uh, flexible classrooms or seminar spaces. Uh, it's really gonna be um, a signature for this signature program. So um, I wanna thank all of those who, who have been involved, as you can see here, for making this a reality. I asked Kat Weaver to get me some highlights of what faculty have done, and she came back with pages and pages, <laughs> right? So I wanted to honor her work. So I have everyone who she highlighted in those pages and pages, uh, what they've done. And I won't be able to go through all of them, but you can see that our faculty are getting uh, major research grants, right? They're publishing books, they're presenting uh, at conferences, they're asked to be panelists. Uh, let's see, let's keep going on. And um, you can always view this later on and you know, pause the video so you can read more about these folks. Yes, Larry, I listed you twice because you just get so many awards. Um, actually, it's because Larry is, is maybe the only faculty member who has official appointments in two different colleges or schools, right? SFTV and, and CFA. So he gets double billing. Uh, but you know, this just shows that our faculty can compete with the best of them. And here's something really interesting. So the NSF publishes uh, what's called HERD data, Higher Education Research and Development data. So here is the, the, the number of grants, or the amount of the grants, this is in thousands, so this is 2.4 million, 4.7 million, 7.1 million. Okay, that's how much grant money these institutions bring in. There's LMU, right? And I didn't want to embarrass our peers. And by peers, I mean <laughs> these are schools that we compete with, okay? And I wouldn't do anything subversive like color code them to their uh, school colors or anything like that. <laughs> but um, you can see that um, you know, we're, we're not just competing with uh, West regional peers, right? We're also competing with national universities, right? Uh, it's just amazing how successful our faculty are in, in getting research funding. And we plan to continue that, right? Kat Weaver is our, our new Associate Provost for Research and Professional Development. And um, here are some strides she's already made. Right? She is going to uh, develop a plan to have both pre- and post-grant success uh, here at LMU. She secured an invite for LMU to apply for the Andrew Carnegie Fellows Program. That's one of the premier fellowships that a faculty member can be awarded uh, in the social sciences. Um, prior to this, we weren't invited. Uh, so that was, and we submitted those, right, Kat? Yes. Um, so we nominated two faculty for that this year. Um, she has also been involved, her expertise uh, at her prior institution is getting over $19 million in grants, many of them institutional grants. So she's already worked with some folks to submit some grants. I won't name these, but, uh, but they're there. Um, and then she's working on um, uh, enhancing our new faculty and year-long orientation programming. And of course, with uh, Professor Martina Ramirez, they've some, done some amazing programming in the Center for Teaching Excellence this year. And of course, there's much more to come. Uh, every step of the way, uh, the William H. Hannon Library has been partnering with our faculty and students. And this is, of course, under the leadership of Dean Chris Brancolini. 
Um, we've had programming, 50 on-campus uh, partnerships, 44 different programs that has attracted over 5,000 attendees. She's championed, the library has championed open access and information literacy. They've worked with schools and colleges to provide better support for research. Um, uh, in particular, I know the CBA has worked with the library to really roll out um, database subscriptions, for example. And then she's grown our digital commons, right, which is one way that our faculty can disseminate their work. And it's been downloaded almost 3.5 million times. We've had some major acquisitions. Last week, we celebrated the launch of the Tony Coelho Center. And um, Tony is, uh, uh, the Honorable Tony Coelho is a, uh, a LMU alum, and he donated all of his papers to the library. Uh, he was a congressman for six terms, and uh, he uh, was the primary author of the Americans with Disabilities Act. So um, uh, researchers can now come to LMU and, and study uh, that momentous uh, act that uh, he was largely responsible for. We have interdisciplinary, I wanna to transition to the interdisciplinary subject now. Um, I first wanna talk about our interdisciplinary centers, which uh, you can see here. I wanna highlight one thing from each. So ACTI uh, did a really great program around the 50th anniversary of the, the Marymount College coming to campus. Uh, the, the Marymount Institute has published two uh, award-winning books now, uh, you can see them there. Uh, uh, the Center for Urban Resilience has done amazing work with students uh, and the local community, and they put on the Green Earth Film Festival uh, just uh, about a month ago. And of course, uh, Study LA uh, did uh, Election Central, and they've of course engaged with uh, so many of our community members through survey research. All told, 200 plus students have been involved in these centers doing interdisciplinary and disciplinary research, internships and service work uh, in the community. How about a round of applause for our centers and our center directors. And speaking of interdisciplinary, Playa Vista, our opening of that campus has really seen some interdisciplinary programming within, right? So these are some of the programs that have been offered there. Uh, uh, symposia, um, showcases, uh, some uh, conferences, uh, CFA even had uh, Shakespeare on the bluff, go off the bluff, uh, into the Playa Vista community. All told, these are the different organizations that have uh, engaged and put on programming down in Playa Vista. So. Um, to a person, everyone who, who I've spoken to who has attended these events have come away mightily impressed with LMU and our board and our president's foresight in going down there to Playa Vista and engaging with that community. And um, I guarantee you, if you host an event down there, it will be a big hit. I mean, the facilities are just amazing. And you can see some of the, the photos here. Okay, so. I did a survey on interdisciplinarity, and um, uh, many people, uh, I did this with faculty and librarians, about 78 folks responded. Uh, here's where they came from. Here are their home departments. Right? It's a word cloud, so the bigger the, the word, the more uh, faculty that came from that department. The law school has no departments, right? So it's big. Um, <laughs> And then I asked, in the past five years, have you co-presented, co-performed, co-created, or co-published with one or more persons? It turns out we're very cooperative here at LMU, right? 75% of the respondents uh, said that they had collaborated. And then I asked, okay, well, if you have collaborated, who did you collaborate with? What were the disciplines of the people that you collaborated with? And here they are, right? Uh, film and TV gets a lot of collaboration as the psychology, history, education. You can see there, and you can always go back uh, online to, to get some more fine detail here. But all told, there are about, um, I think, over 90 different disciplines represented in these collaborative efforts. 
Okay. So then I asked in 250 words or less, please give me some advice about any type of interdisciplinary initiatives that we would offer. People are very honest here. Um, <laughs> things like, oh, I don't believe in interdisciplinarity. Uh, it never works. It's a waste of money. It's hard. It's time consuming work. Uh, therefore, it requires resources, which I totally agree. Um, true interdisciplinarity requires a champion in the form of a person. Uh, it can't come from the top down. Uh, it must uh, be committed to academic excellence. There were uh, many positive comments as well. So um, I don't have time to show any of those, and I'm still trying to parse through them uh, and, and collate them as well. But then I asked folks to please suggest um, topics that they would believe would represent challenges. I didn't even use the word interdisciplinary, but I said challenges that could only be addressed by academics from different disciplines coming and working together. And that's what you have in your hand, right? Uh, it's these. And what I did with the 234 responses that I got was I tried to group them into similar categories or clusters, right? So that's what you see there. And you may say, well, that doesn't belong there. That belongs over there. And that's true. But I could only put them in one place. So that was my first stab at it. Okay. And I have a question I want to ask you. Now, we may not have time to do this, so that's unfortunate. Um, but let's see. If you go back to the website, it's which of these clusters would most likely be addressable by at least five schools or colleges? I don't think we have time, because you're, you're just looking at these right now, right? Do we have time? You want to try this? OK, do it. So you have it in front of you, so it doesn't have to be on the screen. And you can select more than one answer, right? So which of these clusters do you think would, would be applicable to at least five of the colleges or schools, right? Remember, we have seven, right? We have the law school. We have uh, CFA. Um, we have CBA. We have SFTV. We have SOE. We have Seaver. We have BCLA. Did I miss anyone? I think I, yeah, seven. I got them all. And you can see in this one, it's updating in real time. No, I'm good. Thank you. I like audience participation. This is how I used to teach chemistry, too. So I miss it. All right, 91 of you, 90 or so of you, 100 of you have replied so far. This is good, right? Cluster 3 was the biggest one. Okay, so I think that makes sense. Now, I want to I clarify that this isn't it for us coming up with an interdisciplinary initiative, right? We're going to have more engagements on this, including because the internationalization summit was so successful, we're going to have an interdisciplinary, uh, interdisciplinarity summit uh, sometime in the spring. So stay tuned for that. And we'll do a lot more work uh, uh, in the meantime as well. OK, so I think I'm going to stop now. But thank you for your responses. I'm going to I'm going to use these later on and discuss these with my colleagues. Uh, stop that. Okay. The next thing I want to do. This I really don't think we have time to do, but I want to plant the seed in your head because you can take this sheet with you, which is their name cluster one through twelve, right? But we can't go to a foundation and say, hey, I'd like you to uh, fund cluster eight. <laughs> right? Like, what? Uh, so we need names for these clusters, if indeed these will be clusters, right? So what I want you to do is think about what you might name these clusters, especially if you're excited about one of them, right? What could you name this cluster that then an individual or a foundation might get excited about just from the name, okay? And we'll continue this discussion when we engage next 
on interdisciplinarity. Okay. Um, really quick, I want to talk about some new developments. And I'm going to go really quickly through this one because every year, uh, Maureen Weatherall and her team just breaks records, right? Uh, and, and we've heard President Snyder talk about this in his convocation. What I want to talk about is the transfer class, right? Because uh, we have an interesting model. We have a hybrid model for transfer. Many institutions, they enroll transfer students to replace students that they don't retain, right? But our model is a hybrid model, right? And that allows us, so we don't just uh, have a transfer program because we're, we're trying to replace students, we're trying to fill seats, right? We have a transfer model and initiative because we think this fits our mission, right? It allows us to enroll different, uh, different levels of students. And here are some facts. 62% of our transfer students come from community colleges. 13% are international, average age is 21. Uh, there are 24 veterans or dependents of uh, veterans in this year's class. And 25% of our transfer students are from the Latinx uh, community. So this is why we have a transfer program and a hybrid one at that. Uh, a, a couple years ago, we signed a transfer, a guaranteed transfer agreement with the LA Community College system. Right? And we're starting, we saw the very first class of that this year, 31 transfer students. And, and uh, Tom Gudo tells me that we're going to see many more in the future. Uh, it's a guaranteed admission for students who complete certain courses and requirements at the community college level. Uh, we think this program is going to be very successful, so much so that we were invited by Haku to present on this at their national meeting this fall uh, in Atlanta. And then some really big news that just came out last week, we've just signed an agreement with the Arizona Community College District. So now we've increased the number of colleges that can participate in this guaranteed uh, admission program. And that's uh, due in large part to the leadership of Tom Gudo. There he is right there. <laughs> Really quickly, we have some uh, new curriculum. We have two new, now these are ones that have gotten the WASC approval, right? There are many in the hopper still that haven't, uh, they're still going through the process of the WASC approval. They've gone through our own internal processes, but WASC is still waiting on them. You can see two new undergraduate majors, a couple of new graduate degrees, and additional locations, including our Playa Vista. So you have to, you have to get WASC approval for all this stuff, right? And at the helm of this is our, inter, our acting uh, ALO, Jonathan Rothschild. I saw him in the back. Where are you, Jonathan? Thank you. Uh, speaking of curriculum, another person has told me that she is going to be retiring uh, at the end of this year, and that's University Registrar Kathy Reed. Uh, here are some of the things that she has been largely uh, participatory and responsible for um, and contributing to uh, in her time here. You'll see in the end how long she's been here, actually. I won't give that away. But some really uh, amazing things like our, um, our core curriculum, the four semester units, degree works. She's been on various advisory boards and committees, most importantly, She's been uh, the chair of the commencement committee for many years, and especially last year's that cut commencement from four hours to like two hours. <laughs> and did it in a very respectful way, I might add. And there you go, 43 years. And, and she knows, she knows I'm counting when she first started here as a temp right, uh, 43 years ago. So um, thank you, Kathy, for everything you've done and everything you've done for me personally, uh, the advice that you've given me, all the assistance um, whenever I have a question. It's just amazing. Okay, since you're all staying in your seats, I wanna cover these because this is the part for students, right? So students, what can an LMU education do for you? Well, here at LMU, 
you get rigorous academics, right? You have an innovative core curriculum. You have uh, grounding in the liberal arts. Um, you have our social justice mission, our Jesuit and Marymount influence social justice mission. And you have many high impact practices that you can participate in. So a student who does and utilizes these to the fullest, what do they become? They become superstars, right? <laughs> And there's no way that these students can't do anything that they want to do in life. And one thing we would like for them to do in life is to apply for fellowships, right? Uh, that's led by Cassidy Alvarado, our uh, director for fellowships. And if you go to the website, which is right here, you can see that you don't have to be a senior to apply for fellowships. You can't read this, but you can read this. You can be in your fourth year, third year, second year, or first year. They have lots of ways to get you a fellowship or to help you get a fellowship based on your merits. And I'm really happy to announce that they've moved. Right? How many of you knew where, knew where the office was before? OK, not a lot of hands. That's not good. But now you will, right? Because. They're here in the Levy Hall complex, right? And uh, right near McKay. And the best way to remember where it is is it's right near <laughs> Habit Burger. And so students, while you are waiting in line for your burger, um, you can tell your friends to save your spot. You can walk over right over there to the, the fellowship's office, ask some questions, get a pamphlet, and then really explore your full potential. Uh, so. Oh, and they'll also have an open house on December 5th. So uh, I hope that all of us can attend, faculty and staff too, so we can advise our students to go to this new office. Uh, another thing that our superstar students can do is take advantage of Grand and Brimit shop in career and professional development. Here he is with our commencement speaker last year, Ronan Farrell. And he has assembled a diverse and amazingly capable staff of student workers as well as professionals in career and professional development. And the reason I show them here is because of this next uh, innovation that they're adopting. I want you to know that there are lots of people working there because this innovation is a virtual reality innovation, right? It's called VMOC, and the LA Times actually wrote us up uh, among other colleges on um, the successes of some innovations that career and professional development departments are utilizing, including VMOC, which uses artificial intelligence to do a first pass at a resume that a student might submit. And the neat thing about this is it's really the same algorithms that employers are using to screen their resumes that they get. So it's using the same algorithm, so you're really getting some um, Good advice there from uh, Hal, right? Right, Tim? <laughs> we also have Vocare. I wanted to highlight that. This is our retreat for sophomores and transfer students. Since 2016, 400 students have been able to participate. 43 alumni have volunteered their time, and 27 faculty have also participated and mentored our students. Uh, it's an amazing program. Of course, you can learn all about these and more at the website. And I'm really excited about this. So last year, we started a unpaid or underpaid summer internship fund. So now students can apply for internships where employers might not be able to afford to pay them, right? But they can get up to $2,500 in funding for living expenses, transportation, or what have you. And it really has made an impact. So last summer, 52 LMU students were awarded a total of $100,000 to participate in internships, underpaid or unpaid ones, in many cities, this is just a sampling. Uh, and with many companies, again, this is just a small sampling of where those 52 students went. So thank you, Brandon, where are you? Yeah, thanks, Brandon, for all your work in this area. OK, last thing that an LMU education can do for you, students, I'm looking at you, um, and that is Thanks to our Senior Vice President for Student Affairs. Uh, this person has been so creative and innovative over her career here at LMU. 
Uh, she's, a, she's assembled a management team, got this from the website, um, and uh, unlike my management team, this team's pretty stable. There's only one new person on that list, right? And that's Dean of Students, Terry Mangione. How about a round of applause for her and a welcome? This is the picture I like the most. You can't see it, but she has Cura Personalis in Sharpie on her hand. <laughs> but here's what student affairs can do for you. It's just incredible the number of programs and many of these innovations in higher ed that Lainey and her team have put together over the years. And some of them have boxes over them because what we're gonna do online for students who are watching is we're gonna have links for the ones with boxes around them. So you can actually click on them or click on the link, which will be in the page underneath, and go and find out more about these programs, right? Programs in service uh, for psychological and uh, mental health support uh, are very innovative and a nationally known LMU Cares program, which faculty and staff can use to refer students that they feel are in uh, difficulty or trouble or danger. Right? Uh, it's just amazing how many programs that Lainey uh, and her team have created. And students, you really need to take advantage of these. Um, so please, uh, go to, go to the, the, the links on, these, on these, uh, these programs and learn more about them. Remember, you want to become superstars, right? This is one of the ways to do that. OK, so really quickly, thank you for staying with me. Uh, I know I went over, but um, one is I wanted to summarize that I work with an amazing team of professionals. Um, that strategic planning really takes a lot of reflection, but it's a great opportunity for the university, and we'll be doing that uh, in the near future. Uh, that our faculty really exemplify the teacher-scholar model. It is validated externally by organizations like Phi Beta Kappa, uh, by funding organizations. You saw our success in that area. And that interdisciplinarity is tough, right? It's so tough, we hardly had time to do it. Uh, but we're going to engage some more, and it will be completely worth it. And then, you know, here at LMU, new opportunities pre present themselves all the time. And I know our community is ready to take advantage of those opportunities. And I look forward to taking advantage uh, and helping you to uh, take advantage of these opportunities. So in closing, I want to thank these individuals for helping me set up today and, um, and going through this whole process with the technology. And I want to thank you for attending. There's uh, box lunches. Uh, since I went over, now you can take them to go. And um, really, I'm, I'm looking forward to working with you uh, for the rest of this year and beyond. So thank you all. Thank you.